Hello and welcome to another episode of the Trailblazers podcast. I am so excited to finally be having this conversation with the Desiree S. Coleman. Desiree, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here, finally. So being the researcher I am, I was like, you know, we've been connected for a little while now. Yeah. <laughs> and I realized that we'd initially connected on LinkedIn back in like 2016. Oh my gosh. And we started having dialogue 2017. And, and then I ghosted you? And, uh, no, well, <laughs> timing wasn't right. Timing <laughs> wasn't right. We had a, a conversation, timing wasn't right. Finally, we connected this summer. And you know, I, I, I said this to you a month ago. You know, I just believe that everything happens in the right time. Sometimes we want something and God said, no, not right now. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, I share that because there are so many people who reach out to me in, and say, hey, you know, um, I'm reaching out as a content creator to someone and they're not connecting with me. And all too often, um, I find that when those connections happen, when they right. should happen, right. Uh, it's it's more amazing than right. you had wanted it to happen to begin yeah. with. So, yeah. um, so excited to share in this conversation today. There's so much happening in, in, I don't like to, I love evergreen content, but there's so much happening in the world at the point yeah. in which we are recording this conversation. I'm going to jump into some of that because I think it is appropriate for us to discuss yeah. that in today's call. But before we dive in and have you share some wisdom, uh, Let's take two steps back and start okay. where we begin every conversation from a place okay. of gratitude. Yeah. So I thought we could kick things off by having you share an unexpected blessing that you're most grateful for right now. Oh, there's so much. Um, you know, I love if I could just take two steps back just to go to what you said, like when it's your time, when it's right, it's right. And so I just think about how sometimes we try to push and like, make things happen or get frustrated that things aren't happening when they should. And, and what we don't realize is that it's going to happen exactly as it should. So I'm grateful for coming into a season where things are clicking on all cylinders, opportunities, blessings um, are coming my way. I'm stepping out um, personally, like I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like some real estate stuff. So it's things are happening. And I just think like, this is my time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. So let's let's talk background. Where yeah. where did you grow up? I'm from St. Louis, and um, there is there you know there's an artist mm-hmm. Nelly, and I'm I'm just saying he has a line that says I'm from the blue and I'm proud, and so that just resonates with me. But I grew up in St. Louis. Interestingly enough, St. Louis is very black white. Mm-hmm. And I grew up, and at 18, I said, I, I need to move away. I need to have a different experience because I, it, how I would describe it at 18 is there's just this thing. And what I was really acknowledging is systemic racism and mm-hmm. sort of how our community is divided. So I went to grad school at Syracuse, landed in the DMV. Um, and it was like just this glorious experience of seeing um, black people leading and, you know, my dentist, my, you know, my dermatologist, like everybody is black. And it's, it was just an amazing, an amazing time. So. Yeah. So where are you today? Back in St. Louis, right? St. Louis. I left and I'm like, I'm never coming back. Meanwhile, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you know, I know you're in the DMV, but it's expensive. Like no matter be. how much you make, <laughs> it's just an expensive yeah. place. And so, um, after having my first daughter, I, you know, kind of ate my words and I came on back home, um, be close to the family. Now I hear that. Are, is your family from there? Yeah. Uh, I have, I have roots in St. Louis. I also have roots in Louisiana. Yeah. So between those two places, that's home. So you brought up Nelly. Is a, is a your lover of music? A little bit. I mean, to be honest, 
most of what I listen to is like gospel Christian, gospel, like something in that genre. But um, yeah. I do love any good beat that drops. So um, I do love it. <laughs> I love it. So let's bring things forward. Let's talk a little bit about what you have happening today. Yeah. Um, share with us what's driving in the work you're doing. Why is the work you're doing important to you right now? Yeah. So professionally, I work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, um, you know, I have really spent my career dating back to D.C., um, you know, with this common thread of building community. So in D.C., I worked in juvenile justice and, you know, came to understand fragile families, came to understand what it means to have under-resourced communities. So I've taken that with me. Um, throughout my career is like, you know, think about how I can advocate for other people, how I can create space for other people. So you speak about the moment of time we're in. And, you know, it's just this catalyzing moment where we have to ask for what we want to create the change that we want to see. So within my organization, I've been a part of conversations that are really challenging our leadership to think about um, how we serve particularly with black leaders and how we ensure that, you know, the work that we're doing is responsive to um, diverse communities as well. So a, a little bit of everything. Personally, I'm trying to lift up and prop up, you know, other diverse leaders around me. Um, it's a heavy moment. And so um, really thinking about this as like the marathon. So we have to keep going, we have to keep pushing, but this, this is our moment to, to make our, our requests and our demands known. I couldn't agree more. Um, we talk about this season. There's so much happening, uh, racial and social injustice, COVID, uh, yeah. everything. A whole global pandemic. Whole global pandemic, a whole White House pandemic. Um, you know, so much happening, right? Yeah. Um, as, as we, first off, before I even touch that, how are you coping in this season with everything that's happening? Yeah, I think I think when COVID first happened, you know, I think it was surreal to all of us. You know, I like I got an email that was like, do not come back to work. And it was like, okay, you know, and so just kind of figuring out what that means. I had, you know, I have two young daughters. And so figuring out the schooling piece, how to support them. And, you know, early on, I was really, really, really intentional about trying to maintain some of my self-care practices. So outside of COVID, yoga, meditation, you know, kept me balanced um, and also working out. And so I started off really good. I started <laughs> <laughs> really good working out. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's been like, Woo! Um, But I also am just giving myself grace, like do what you can, um, you know, just do what you can and recognize it's a whole global pandemic. So if you don't hit that standard, it's okay. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more on you? everything that you just shared. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I I think I got through six weeks of, you know, one of these beach body workouts and body feeling right. And You're like, yes. everything <laughs> just started going downhill real fast. Um, and I went like three months just plopped on the couch, um, eating everything I shouldn't, that makes me feel good. Yeah. And um, finally, you know, the last couple of weeks, I was like, hey, you know, we, we can't see those numbers on a scale. So mm -hmm. I, I'm steadily kind of getting back to the workout. Yeah. I, I still won't say that I'm eating what I should be eating. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the self-care thing is real, you know, and um, this has been a difficult year. Obviously, uh, this time this is coming, this, this episode is dropping. This is the first year where there's eight, nine months of no content. So it's been a challenging year, but there's so much to be grateful for, as you shared at the top, you know, taking one step at a time. Um, the mantra of, of the year for me that I remind myself of daily is take it one hour at a time. Yeah. One hour at a time. Helpful. Yeah, because some days, uh, you know, people will say one day. No, some days I just, I have to like push myself one hour, one task, yeah. one step. 
Yeah. And just say, hey, let's just take one step today and see what happens. That's real. I'm and moving. So yeah. if you could see the amount of boxes and the stuff and, and like if you tackle any big project, it's overwhelming and you're, you know, you're like, how can I get the, all of this done? And I'm like, one box. Just put stuff in this one box. Yes. Seal it up and like, you know, and then like, let's go on to the next thing. So I'm with you. Yes, yes, yes. I love it. Um, as we think about the current political moment <laughs> that we're in right now and the climate, um, share with us what it takes or what it means to create this, this psychological safety in, in a workplace setting, right? Yeah. So I think a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll see on, you know, corporate inclusion statements, like we value all employees and like bring your whole self to work. Um, I don't really think um, organizations realize what it takes from the organization to really make that possible. So when we think about creating inclusive environments, it's really not just having diversity. That's just a that's just a diverse set of people in the room. You know, it's really actually moving past inclusion because inclusion just says, I invite you to the meeting. Belonging says, I actually listen to your voice. I actually, uh, you, know, uh, you know, empower you to speak and to lead. Um, and I think if that's not present, then there is this sort of um, calculated moves that black professionals have to make in navigating their career and navigating when to speak up and, you know, deciding when to push and when not to push because they're truly not in an environment where they can say what they actually mean, where they can be authentic. Um, and so that is an organization in that case that would like lack psychological safety. So when you have to play like these mental Olympics of like, okay, well, if I, if I go straight to, you know, to, to Tommy and then, you know, Susie's, I mean, it's, so it's this, it's this calculation that we have to make as black professionals in order not to upset the apple cart. Um, and, and that, and that's tiresome, right? Mm. You do your job and then you do that other job. And so I think the ideal would be that organizations truly value the unique set of voices that they have at the table. They welcome those voices when those voices speak, they listen and they give space for, um, for, for diverse folks to shine. You better preach. <laughs> I love what you just said because it's not just checking the box and saying, hey, we have the head count to say we are diverse. Yeah, yeah. To say, hey, we value your presence in this room. Yeah, yeah. We value your expertise. Yes. We value your input mm -hmm. and your unique experiences. Mm -hmm. And we we don't want you to have to go through 10 million other hoops yes. To, yes. to showcase that Yeah. in this yeah. room. Show up in this room and be present in this room Yeah. on an equal footing with everyone exactly. else in the room. And you know what? I don't think organizations realize, so there's a statistic that when employees feel included, they're 4.6 times more likely to do their best work. So you, there's actually an ROI on inclusion. And so when you think about you know, simply moving past diversity, um, it, it, it's, it's ensuring that the people that you have there feel empowered um, to, to lead and to speak up and to challenge because that's the space that innovation happens in, right? Mm -hmm. I already know, like when you think about the Intel study that says for every one percentage increase in black and Latino leadership, there's a 3% increase in revenue you only get there when those leaders are empowered to lead. And so I really think this idea of psychological safety and, and ensuring people are empowered to speak up is, is truly important. So this sounds like a top-down challenge for corporations and leaders, yeah. in, especially in this season. Yes. Um, there are so many organizations and and especially leaders today who are fearful of getting canceled, fearful of how to step into um, yeah. some of this. Uh, what does it take to, to be able to, as a leader, 
yeah. to step into some of this? What what do you need to possess in this season? Yeah. I think the answer is actually really simple. And it's empathy, right? So it's this idea that as a human being, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to understand your experiences. I'm going to understand the things that um, have created the conditions that we see, right? So it's a willingness to examine our organization. It's a willingness to look at the processes and the procedures that have produced the results. So if you see an organization that has a dearth of leadership at the top, it's stopping to ask the questions. What about our recruitment process got us here? What, are, you know, how are candidates funneled out even as they made it to the interview stage? It's looking at all of that data to understand how, how the systems um, created conditions that were either favorable or not favorable um, to black and brown people. And I think once you are willing to take a long, hard assessment, we talk about this term equity and it is a buzzword and it's thrown out a lot, but really equity is once you diagnose the problem, once you understand what the disparity is, you take the steps to correct it. And that may mean, okay, well, we need to make sure, you know, our, our, our uh, job descriptions aren't overly gendered so that we aren't discouraging female candidates. We need to ensure that as we're recruiting, we're casting a bigger net to ensure we can get diverse candidates. It's, it's all of those things, it's diagnosing how we got here. And, and I think that's important because a lot of, you, I mean, chief diversity officer is the hottest job on the streets, right? And so organizations are, rushing to put leaders in place, which is the right thing to do. And I think coupled with that, they have to be willing to kind of assess their organization and where there are pain points. And leadership says you identify the pain points and you create a path forward through it. So I think it starts with empathy. I, I couldn't agree more. I worry that um, while, again, checking the box, getting a chief diversity officer in the door, having the conversation and hearing what needs to be done, but struggling fearfully to step into the public eye, right? Yeah, yeah. I think people can respect, like, we did an assessment. Here's what we found. Here's what we're going to do about it. I think yeah. people respect that. I think silence speaks louder than anything else, right? So I think it's, it, it's almost like the courage to kind of own mm -hmm. who you are and be willing to kind of chart a path forward. Um, and, and I think that can take, you know, a bunch of different paths. I say people have to be along their journey. And if you think about the, the, the diversity, equity, inclusion, like it probably starts with like cultural awareness on one point, then it's like, okay, well, we need to have a diverse collection of people then it's like inclusion is actually important. Then it's like belonging is, you know, something we really value. Equity is amazing. Justice is, you know, the end goal. And so um, organizations are, and individuals are going to be on different, uh, different spaces within that spectrum and their level of understanding and their level of comfort. But it's like in anything, how do you get better? You read. You mm -hmm. practice, you try, you fall down, you iterate, you get back up and you stay in the game. And so I just think people have to um, be willing to, A, empathize, understand folks' experience, use data to, 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 to validate, you know, the, what folks are saying and then do something. Yeah. And, like, that is, like that is the piece when people are like, I don't know what to do. Bro, or sis, <laughs> like... <laughs> You within your seat of power can make can make ripples, right? You can make changes. So part of it is leadership, ownership, and accountability to say ultimately the buck stops with me. Whether that's culture, whether that's representation, whether that's the way team members feel included, it stops with that leader. And so your question was around how do how do leaders step into the conversation? having the courage, yeah. right, to really explore, look at the data, and then chart a path forward. People respect that, I believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't agree with you more because on the individual front, your people want you to lead. Yeah. Um, in this season, 
I've experienced it. I've heard several other people share the same experience yeah. where there are many of our white counterparts in the workplace saying, hey, you know, approaching us um, in tears saying, hey, I, I, I don't know how to speak to this. I, I feel bad about what's happening right now. Yeah. And I imagine for every one that reaches out, there are so many others who are mm -hmm. silent and don't know how to speak to it, but want to. And so you have, if, if leadership doesn't invite that dialogue, right, and an environment for that dialogue, you have so many people not knowing how to engage. I will also say, so to that point, I was literally on a call yesterday um, and this very question was posed. And I, and I think we have to, um, I was listening to a talk by Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, and yeah. he said, you know, love his work, but he said, none of us are responsible for the systems that we see, right? I didn't create them. You didn't create them. We didn't create them, right? Mm -hmm. But we are responsible for if we maintain that system or if we evolve that system to work for everyone, right? And so, you know, what I said yesterday really is that as you look around any American institution or as you look at whether it's policing, whether it's the educational system, whether it's um, the racial wealth gap, whether it's healthcare, if you look at the systems and you say, you know what, we're doing pretty good, then great. However, if you look at the systems and you notice disparities, you notice how certain segments of our population are disproportionately impacted. If you notice how certain um, segments of our citizenry are not treated fairly, then you're acknowledging there's a problem and you're either complicit or you are challenging. And so that's, I try to like make people understand being a silent, like, oh, but my heart is in a good place. And I like, you know, love, light, positive vibes, like I'm wishing you well, like is not enough. Either you are complicit in maintaining the current systems that you acknowledge aren't working or you are actively working to better it. And that can be big ways and small ways. So, you know, within that context, they were like, well, what do I do within my organization? I'm like, have you voiced any, you know, if you see a disparity, like, hey, I notice our sales team um, doesn't really have diverse representation. Have you voiced that? Have you asked for opportunities um, for your teams and your managers and your leaders to engage on the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion? Have you asked for the organization's plan to address that? And the, the gentleman I was speaking with was a white gentleman. I'm like, and you're a white ally. Yes. So use your voice. Everybody has a role to play. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the voice that has so much more impact in many ways on our behalf. Yeah. And I've had um, white folks, particularly white men, reach out to me um, who are, have been doing their own work, have been researching, you know, and, and they'll say like, I know you don't want me because I'm a white man. No, 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 no. I, I, I do. <laughs> I absolutely want you. I want you to speak up. You're going to be in rooms that I'm not in. You're going to be privy to conversations that I am not. So I absolutely need you. Again, it's all of us. And yeah. that's Black folks included. Yes. Right? Yes. So you can't be, you know, on the gram like, mm, that's messed up as you scroll by. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, you have to actively be working and, and lending your voice or doing your part to lift, you know, to lift others up and to make, create the conditions we want to see. What Desiree is saying is you can just drop a blackout on Instagram and Come on. You don't show Come up for on. the rest of the year. Come on. <laughs> 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 so let me ask you is yeah. you're you're specifically beyond the work nine to five um i see that you're you're working to serve women right um is that women in a corporate setting is that women that are on, is it all women in a professional setting that you're your tribe yeah i'll <laughs> tell you i'll tell you really the the genesis um yeah. so you know, I, as I think about, I wrote a personal mission statement mm -hmm. and it's to create equitable and empowering conditions for women in organizations. And really that captures the two things that are, you know, nearest to my heart, which is 
this concept of how do we transform organizations. So, um, you know, that, that relates to my nine to five, but also my five to nine. So I have a consultancy firm that really sits and does the deep work with organizational assessments to say, how can we go from this point to that point, right? Um, however, as I started to understand, um, I'll just be transparent, right? So, you know, you and I, you, you, you mentioned that you reached out, you know, back in like 2016, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, at that time, I was running a social venture. I had launched this venture um, focused specifically on black and nonprofit, black and brown nonprofit leaders. Um, and how to empower them to, to better take advantage of fundraising and to, you know, to grow their operations and their organization. So did my MVP, did my, you know, my beta test, got some seed funding, launched the first cohort. It was a success, right? Um, that's right around the time that you reached out to me. Um, launched the second cohort. Um, and essentially what I didn't know is that I was headed into a storm, right? You, you, you mm -hmm. never get that advanced memo. Like, Nothing. there's never <laughs> a dove that floats by like, girl, watch out. Like, you know, like, so I didn't know that. And so um, I went through a tumultuous, like, two to three year period. But God is good, okay? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm on the other side. I'm doing well. And your girl is so blessed. And so I say all that to say, in coming through, that season, um, I still had to show up to work every day with a smile on my face. Mm. No one could know, you know, all the the pain that I was experiencing. That speaks to that psychological safety piece, right? I literally did not have room at work to break down because they would have been like, mm. you know. And so I, I feel like, and I actually I, I express this and. You know, I kind of got a little bit of challenge, like, well, you know, you're supported, and I am supported. My leaders are amazing. But in reading the memo by Minda Hart, she, she talked about, like, there's an entire chapter on how calculated you have to be at work. So what it did for me was affirm my experience, um, that it wasn't just me trying to be a perfectionist. It actually was that for Black leaders, there's a tenuous relationship um, and you're standing within the organization. So you are constantly proving yourself. You're constantly, you know, sort of um, showing why you deserve to be at the table. Um, and so there is no room for you to be off or to have an off day or off season. So as I started to understand that, and as I started to kind of heal from that tumultuous season, I was like, you know what, I have... <laughs> like five specific things that I have learned that I want to share on and pass to other women um, and help encourage and inspire them. So in addition to my consultancy, I, I launched The Queen Within, which is really around providing resources and, and support for, for women. How do women get involved with that? So you can find me on Instagram at Queen Within You, also on Facebook. That, was a, that was a nice plug, thank you there. <laughs> Coming back to the workplace and, and the women that you're serving right now, what do you think, what do you think, and you, you just touched on this, what do you think a lot of women right now in your tribe are expressing in private that they're not wanting to share in the office? Ooh, I could write a whole book on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, there was... Um, there was a Medium uh, article that was like, um, your Black coworkers are actually not okay. Um, there was a Wall Street Journal article that came out and, you know, talked about um, how Black leaders are now being called upon to, to speak. And folks are, folks are kind of weighing that, like, if I'm truly honest, mm -hmm. is there going to be retribution if, you know, if I... Um, call out some of the things that I'm seeing, like what, is, you know, what is that going to mean for me professionally long term? And so I think a lot of people are wanting to speak up and are scared. I think, um, you know, particularly around the, the, the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, um, you know, 
a lot of my colleagues talked about how they have to still, you know, show up for the calls, show up for the Zoom meetings, be on while Not you're on. feeling this visceral reaction to atrocities all around you. And I think, you know, so I appreciate that there's now, you know, that the House passed the commission really to look at the effects of uh, racism um, on, on Black lives because there's actually data that shows the, how your brain waves are altered as you experience racism. And yeah. so I think just carrying that burden of having to smile, having to be on while you're dealing with all this stuff is another thing that people, people are facing. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I love having this conversation. Um, you know, I could keep going for a bit. Um, one last thing as a mom, mm. you have two, two young ones. Mm -hmm. My babies. How, what, in, in all that you've shared, right? Um, what are you hoping that, you know, how are you hoping to impact and change the world for them? Yeah. So I want to blaze a trail. You yeah. There. You see yeah. What there. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, um, you know, they, there are open doors and opportunities. So for me, I want them to feel limitless, right? So I, there's that special, like childlike um, glow that I, it's, and I'm trying to protect it, you know, cause the world can try to beat it down, but I'm trying to protect it. And I'm trying to affirm who they are. And I'm trying to be like, oh my gosh, your, your brown skin is amazing. And like, I'm just, I'm trying to like, just nurture that gift that they have. Um, and, in all the work that I do, ensure that whenever they show up to the workplace or whenever they launch their business, they won't have a problem getting capital, right? Mm -hmm. They won't be screened out because of their name. Mm -hmm. um, they won't experience, you know, all of the microaggressions that many black professionals do. Um, and that they'll have a level playing field, really. So the equity is all about, you can't predict someone's future based on their race, their gender, where they were born, any other feature. It's that the, 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 the playing field is level and everybody has a chance to be their best self. So that's the work that I do today. It's the legacy I hope I leave for them. And, and it's my why. Yeah, yeah. And you're part of, no part of my why with this platform for my brown skin girl. And I'm I'm always singing Beyonce's oh, Brown Skin damn. Girl to her. <laughs> the jam. It's like the theme song right. for them. I just want to affirm them. Yeah. Them to know how beautiful they are. Um, so so I actually curate a lot of content on LinkedIn really because I'm I'm trying to keep this conversation going. Um, I know that's how you and I connected. Yeah. I just I, I give that to the community as well. We'll love to connect on LinkedIn. It's Desiree S. Coleman. But I think that as we're, and I'm like trying to give like statistics, like here's something you could say to your organization because <laughs> I, I want us to be having this conversation. It's necessary. Absolutely. Absolutely. As we wrap up, Blazer Nation loves to hear the resources of our guests. So uh, are there any books that you yeah. are, are reading right now that you think we should, should add to the queue? Yeah. Um, so I listed the memo. I'm totally fangirling her. Um, <laughs> that's my Minda Hart. Oh, oh, you're showing out. I knew she was a guest. Do you know, actually, just to bring it like full circle, um, I listen to all my books on Audible. And so I was like washing dishes and I'm like listening to the memo. And she was like, Stephen A. Hart. And I was like, is that the same? So I had to like scroll through. And like you said, go back to 2016. I was like, oh my gosh, it's the same person. Um, so again, everything happens when it's supposed to. Um, I just finished yesterday, More Than Enough by Elaine Welterog. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great read. I, I believe any black woman would enjoy it. Um, and I'm also reading um, I'm Still Here by Austin Channing Brown. Um, and it's really around like her experience as a black woman. I think it's actually the subtitle is 
um, anti-blackness in the world that's made for white. So um, it's a really good read. Blaze Nation, add those to the queue. One last question for you. Yes. What's one action our Blaze Nation should take this week that's going to help them to blaze their trail? This week, I would say read an article that's centering equity. Learn about um, a, a diversity dimension outside of your own and then take an action, whether that is I regularly um, will like sign little petitions and like I will call. I will call, um, you know, legislatures to make my voice heard. Um, I'm in Missouri. We have an election coming up on August 4th. Make sure you're registered to vote um, and learn as much as you can about issues that affect underrepresented groups. That was like five things <laughs> all in one. I guess what I'm saying is, you know, be a part of democracy. Use your voice would be the overall thing. Yes. Desiree S. Coleman, this has been a blessing. You've dropped so much gems of wisdom. Yay. Um, I'm so I, excited. I, 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 am excited. I, am, I am grateful because this affirms uh, that this call happened when it should have happened. Yeah. Because we wouldn't have gotten this back in 2017. I wouldn't have. You're right. You're right. You're right. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for Robert. having me. You're now part of our family. You're now part of the Blaze Nation community. So okay. everybody make sure you are following Desiree and hit her up on, on social and let her know how much you appreciate this content. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for all you do as well. Thank <laughs> you for creating this space. Thank you.